احاول اعرف دكتور حسام الجهني اكاديميا هيز ان اسيستنت بروفيسور ات جامعه الامام واستشاري جراحه المخ والاعصاب هيز ا كونسلتنت نيورو فاسكولار نيورو سيرجن نيورو انترفينشنست اند نيورو كريتيكال كير از ويل هيز ان ادجنت بروفيسور ات ماجيل يونيفرستي اند اي بليف ات هيوستن تكساس ميثودست از ويل Um, he have been the regional program director of neurosurgery for a while now, and عضو مجلس إدارة عديد من ال 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 الأقسام وعضو مجلس إدارة عديد من المجالس العلمية منها مجلس العلمي لجراحة المخ والأعصاب ومجلس العلمي الجمعية السعودية لجراحة المخ والأعصاب والعديد والعديد من الأشياء. أتوقع لو if I stayed and if I continue to just elicit الأشياء اللي عملها الدكتور حسام الله يعطيه الصحة والعافية. It's going to take me another 10, 15 minutes. But uh, I'll give him the mic to start presenting uh, to you uh, his experience with uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage uh, vasospasm. Dr. Hassan. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, thank you, Khaled and, and Jamil, for the nice uh, introduction. Uh, it's, uh, it's a continuous process, and we're all working together. So. Um, and we all build on each other and we feed off each other's positive energy. Um, the, the talk, I will, I will just share my screen. Um, do you see the screen now, uh, Khaled? Yes, we do. Okay, good. So, um, you make the it to present view. Hello. Can yes. you make it as a presentation view? Let me show you the slide that all the slide. Oh, yes, yes. Just a second. Yeah. No. That's better. Okay. So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So, the the topic I was, I uh, mean. Uh, going to present today is subarachnoid hemorrhage vasospasm what when and where i will not dare answer why because nobody knows why uh, vasospasm happens in subarachnoid hemorrhage but uh, it is part of what uh, keeps it challenging and um, in a way interesting for for who, those who um, treat patients with subarachnoid hemorrhage um, I have nothing to disclose related to this slide, uh, to these slides that I'm presenting. I usually start my presentation with this slide, and uh, in honor to honor our, uh, in order to honor our uh, teachers and our mentors, uh, who you know, we only do them due, their due respect if we advance beyond them, beyond what they taught us and pass it to the next generation. Um, the topic at hand. Uh, I don't know why this is stuck for some reason. Okay, here it is. So the, um, the subject at hand is subarachnoid hemorrhage and the, the global statistics are variable. It's 10 to 6 to 10% of all uh, cerebrovascular accidents. The statistics in the country is lacking uh, because uh, lack of registries and um, um, ongoing um, data collection, but we have to work on that. And I think we're not uh, less than the rest of the world when it comes to uh, affliction with subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now, this is, uh, we have to start the, the story from the beginning because it's not the aneurysm that we see that the, that uh, rupture that is the problem. Uh, here's a person who has an, uh, a circle of Willis like all of us. And when we look at the top two images, you see the gray scale and the red uh, three volume rendering. There is no aneurysm in there. But when you look at uh, shear wall stress and, um, and the flow dynamics, we can understand that some vessels in the same person, notice that I'm saying person, this is not a patient yet. So in this same person, we have uh, red, which is associated with high shear wall stress, and blue, which is less stress. And, you can see that there there is a vessel here on the left side that has um, like more stress than the rest of the circulation and that intuitively might lead to further aneurysm formation if the patient is having risk factors whether it's diabetes or, or hypertension or they are smoking or they fall into the wrong genetics so the, um, the main point here is that it's an arteriopathy that 
one can treat. And there is a, 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 some hints in the literature that aspirin can help these uh, pathologies, including uh, aneurysm formation. So we will keep an eye on that. Um, it's not moving for some reason. I'll just... Uh, so again, it's pure mechanics or environmental factors or risk factors like smoking, hypertension, excessive alcohol, or familiar occurrence. The problem is that the most, the strongest risk factor is the familiar occurrence or occurrence which have, we have no, we are born into our families. Like in this uh, uh, global population study, you can see that the Finnish uh, fin people from Finland and from Japan they have more aneurysms than the rest of the world because of certain endem uh, endemicity of uh, certain genetic uh, abnormalities. Um, but also the aneurysms themselves are not the same because this, this is an example of one of the genetic mutations, uh, uh, endothelial neuron, uh, new, um, nitrous oxide synthase. If the, the more mutations in this gene, the more the aneurysm is prone to, to uh, rupture. Now, when it comes to vasospasm, if you look at the same factor that leads to, to, to rupture of an aneurysm, itself is found to have more and in, more indication of clinical and angiographic vasospasm. So it is a continuation of the same story. Then we come to uh, haptoglobin, which is known as a blood, uh, blood uh, breakdown product in the subarachnoid space that can lead to the vasospasm. And uh, the rest of the factors like uh, apolipoprotein E and the rhinoids and synthetion, synthet, synthetion, um, uh, synthase, these are all related to the coagulation cascade. So from this slide, you can understand that we have something that is related to inflammation and something that is related to thrombosis that are promoting the vasospasm. It's not really, really the muscle vasospasm action that one can conceive it from the name. Uh, so when the rupture happens, there is a whole different world that changed for the patient. And it's a killer hemorrhage because 50% of patients die in the first month. And the remaining people, uh, the survivors of these, they suffer a significant uh, burden of morbidity and uh, disability. And very few make it back to where they were uh, before the, the hemorrhage happens. So when we want to uh, approach the patient with subarachnoid hemorrhage, we have to think of it in, in an early phase and a subacute phase. In the early phase, what we worry about is the re-bleeding and the sympathetic overactivity that can render the patient in a very bad shape. Like we look at subarachnoid hemorrhage patients, we will see them from time to time. They are, they are different. They're not, they are not two subarachnoid hemorrhage patients are the same although they're graded the same, but we, we see that they are different from uh, one aspect or another. And then there is this delayed cerebral ischemia that we all fear. Uh, so for those who are not familiar with the scale, uh, scale grading uh, scales for the patients, we have the, the hunt and hiss, the classical one, descriptive. The worse the patient, the higher the number. So you see asymptomatic with mild headache, then moderate to severe headache with a fixed deficit, like a third nerve palsy. And then a third uh, grade three, which is confusion, lethargy. And this is very subjective and it can cause uh, difference in, in allocation to grade three. Stupor and coma are like kind of uh, morbid uh, conditions and no one will have a mistake in there. Uh, but to be very, to be practical and have reproducibility, um, the World Federation of Neurological Society, Neurosurgical Societies developed this grading system, which really dumbs it down to GCS and deficits. So you can have the nurse evaluate that, you can have an intern evaluate that, you, have can, you can have a neurosurgery resident, ICU residents, ER residents, they all agree because we all can calculate a GCS and we can look at the patient if they have a deficit or not. So it becomes more reproducible and more coherent when we come to grading skills. The, the other coin, part of the coin or face of the coin here is the clinical picture, which is, the, how bad is the patient clinically? Now, if I, if I show you these slides, these, these are numbered one, two, three, four, um, which one will be a good grade? Which one will be a bad grade? 
I mean, we can all agree that number four is in a bad condition. So that is not a question. This, this is going to be four, five. If they're lucky if they're three. But number one, number two, and number three can be anything. So the picture with the small amount of subarachnoid hemorrhage does not mean that the patient is not in a bad condition. And that's why this uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage is really, really um, intricate and delicate when we want to deal with it. So you, you look at the image, you think that the patient is okay. You look at them, the patient themselves, they're doing horribly. Uh, so the Fisher grading is the uh, amount of subarachnoid hemorrhage, and it is found to have some correlation with the incidence of vasospasm. Before we can jump into vasospasm, we have to have an, a, a highlight on, on two things that happen in the acute phase, which is the transient global ischemia. And this is just to simplify it. When there is a subarachnoid hemorrhage, the, the moment the aneurysm pops, there is a, a severe reaction of the vessel around it, like the next to it, like MCA or uh, anterior communicating artery. And this, this artery goes into severe spasm, and this gives global ischemia. And it's also related to the in sudden increase in high ICP that would render the whole brain, not only one hemisphere, but the whole brain uh, hypoperfused. So here you can see a sudden rise in the subarachnoid, uh, uh, subarachnoid space pressure with a significant drop in the perfusion of the brain. Um, we give tranexamic acid to prevent the re-bleeding, but that's just a caveat for, for you to know. And we hope that we, we will be right as we go along because the margin of benefit is minimal, as you can see here. Uh, again, reminder of the faces of subarachnoid hemorrhage that can be deceiving, and we have to take the clinical aspect very, very seriously and know how to evaluate for subtle changes in the patient condition. Um, the other um, deadly phenomena that happens with the subarachnoid hemorrhage is the, uh, is the global cerebral edema where you have a patient who just developed the headache and all of a sudden they started deteriorating, deteriorating. They, from every stop, like from when they had the headache in the office, they, they're okay, but now they're becoming sleepy in the ambulance. By the time they get to the hospital, they're comatose. Why? Because this, this, there is this significant edema that uh, affects the whole hemisphere blocks all basal cisterns and make make the patient at risk of uh, internal herniation. Uh, this is thought to be a severe diffuse ischemic encephalopathy or vasomotor paralysis where the autoregulation is lost and the blood just keeps gushing into the brain and uh, causes this um, uh, significant increase in ICP. Uh, it's usually associated with bad uh, outcomes and bad subarachnoid hemorrhage grades. And just give it all what you can. Just uh, treat the patient uh, as aggressive as you can with everything you have. 24, 48 hours is what we need to, to come over the hump of this edema, and we hope for the best. So again, you see the, the repetitive nature of some of the factors that are related with the formation of the aneurysm, the vasospasm, and also this uh, aggressive nature of, uh, of uh, phenomenon of subarachnoid hemorrhage. So, uh, just to tell you that we are dealing with a, a vascular pathology, not a subarachnoid blood uh, that is the, the, the source of the issue. Then where the story goes along to uh, what is the effect of the blood products in the brain uh, that can lead to subarachnoid hemorrhage? We have myocardial stunning, labile hypotension, immune dysregulation, and what is the relation to vasospasm is that the main regulator of autoregulation in the brain is, hypo, is the hypothalamus. So when that is defective with the presence of the subarachnoid blood or the sentinel spasm that happens in the, say, ACOM, then the patient might be at risk of uh, vasospasm. So, and you remember I mentioned some of the, path, uh, the molecular factors are inflammatory pathways, in fact, and this is why there is an intricate interplay between inflammation, thrombosis, ischemia, and this will becoming a, become a vicious cycle that the patient might suffer from. So sympathetic discharge, thrombosis, inflammation, these are the key factors where we understand why some patients develop vasospasm more than others. 
So here, when we have the catecholamine surge, it can affect the heart, the lung, the kidney, everything that can be affected. And we have to be careful when addressing this because the patient might look in, into having a full-blown MI on top of their poor, cl poor clinical cl grade and the cerebral edema and um, the decreasing level of consciousness. But again, this is something when we know that this is happening, we can just tough it out and give the patient some uh, chronotropic support or inotropic support for the patient. Melanone usually works very well for those. And then we can get over this acute phase um, in a good way and um, hope for the best because the worst is still to come. Now we come to where vaso vasospasm happens. So here we have the blood that is now is in the subarachnoid space sitting there for a few days, the RBCs are starting to break down and the hemoglobin gets released, the haptoglobin gets released. Now the brain is not gonna just sit there, it's gonna be triggered by, the, by these changes and all sorts of uh, inflammation, inflammatory process will ensue. Free radicals will increase in the subarachnoid space and in the cortex and that will lead to vasoconstriction and you can see endothelin, nitrous oxide, inflammation, IL-6 inflammation, the calcium channel is, um, is part of like where the cells are gonna die. And uh, the vascular endothelium is, is a major player in promoting the inflammation, if you may. So it's not in the big vessel, it's not in the MCA where the problem is. And we'll see that later on in the talk. So in here to put it all together, you have the microthrombosis, the, microvascular dysfunction, the inflammation, and the large vessel spasm, all of them leading to uh, either edema or cell death. And then from there we go for um, cortical uh, depression. And from there we go to uh, delayed cerebral ischemia. I mean, you can spend the whole day talking about this particular slide, but uh, I will just skip for the sake of time. So what do we do usually when you're, when the neurosurgical pay, uh, residents or the ICU residents admit patients to subarachnoid hemorrhage for subarachnoid hemorrhage, what is the admission order include? Nemodipine, calcium channel blocker. It's a weak calcium channel blocker, but it was found to, to benefit the patient with subarachnoid hemorrhage that it would reduce the, the, the severity of the vasospasm. <laughs> Mind you, 70% of, of the patients with subarachnoid hemorrhage will have radiological vasospasm. But those who suffer clinically are like about a third. So what we do in, when we give the, the, the nemodipine is that we reduce the severity, uh, sorry, we reduce the, the, the severity of the vasospasm if it happens, but we don't reduce the overall incidence. Then we come to sodium and uh, sodium is peculiar because this is one of the and things that you have to follow very diligently when you're looking at the subarachnoid hemorrhage patients. Uh, my residents in neurosurgery and ICU, they know when I say hello, the very next question is going to be what is the sodium of the patient before we discuss anything else, because that's going to categorize the patient in my mind, whether this is a good subarachnoid hemorrhage patient who passed the clipping and the coiling and all the rest of it. Now, are we in the phase where this patient is going to vasospasm or not? The first filter in my mind is sodium. It's very helpful because it can tell you what is going on with the hypothalamus and the rest of the cascade that can um, uh, help us monitor the patients better. Statins uh, is very controversial, but they work in many different ways to antagonize what leads to subarachnoid hemorrhage. I mean, I know it's not very clear in the guideline that uh, statins are helpful, but if, if they have an anti-excitotoxicity effect, they have an um, effect on decreasing microthrombosis and they um, uh, modulate the immune response and they have, uh, they attenuate the, the, the free radical uh, activity, then why not use it? So here's the point, is there is not harmful. They're definitely not harmful. And if we can give it for two weeks just to bridge the patient over vasospasm, it's a good thing. Um, we, we reached a sort of a middle ground in our hospital that we don't give it to everybody, but if the patient is having an accelerated path towards vasospasm or they develop severe vasospasm, then we give them the statin in a higher dose. Usually for 14 days and then we stop. Just to complete the picture, it's not only blood in the subarachnoid hemorrhage, cortical irritation. Cortical irritation can be seizures. 
So we have to uh, take into consideration that cortical depression can actually proceed into cortical excitation and that can kind of uh, promote or worsen vasospasm if it's happening. So anticonvulsants, so when, I, when I first started my residency in neurosurgery in like God knows when, it's like 2002, everybody took antiepileptics. And then it started to come shorter and shorter as an indication. And now we give it to people who have um, a temporal hematoma or parenchymal breach, or those who actually presented with low, uh, with low, with a seizure, or with those who presented with low GCS. Now we come to vasospasm and we look at the vessels. So for the next five minutes, we will be talking about the vessels of the brain and how they function. So bear with me a little bit. So this is what we see on, on anatomy or autopsy, the big circle of Willis, the famous MCA, the famous basal artery, the anterior cerebral artery, and all the rest of them. Uh, we take a closer look. We have perforators, the lenticulocyte perforators that go within the parenchyma. We don't see them in the cortical surface. Take a bit of a surgical look, and this is what you see when you see the patient's uh, cortices in the, in the, during the surgery. You see that the, the, the big vessel is in the sulcus, and then there is a branch over the gyrus, and then there, there are these branches over the cortex, then they dive into the brain substance. We don't see them anymore. But if you go across section in the brain, you will see them there everywhere in the gray matter very high in the in the white matter, the gray matter very high where the cortex is, and then when it comes to the white matter, it becomes like little um, branches of a tree. Go with the electron microscope. This is what you see. It's all vessels. It's all vessels. So we wonder like what is the ratio for neurons and, and vessels. That's why we consider the, the brain as a neurovascular organ rather than a neural organ. Um, and we talk about the models now of how the circulation is. The simplistic way of looking at um, vasospasm is that there is a blood vessel that is going into spasm. So it's one tube goes into spasm, just open it up and things will be solved. Now, you have to understand that the resistance in the artery is more than the vein, more than the capillary, is more than the capillaries, and then those are more than the vein. And there are the, the, the arborization between the arterioles and the capillaries, so it kind of forms a network. So what we really look into is uh, like literally branches of a tree for understanding of uh, vasospasm and where, where it happens and the autoregulation where it happens. Now, the autoregulation is our ability to keep the blood uh, blood vol uh, flow into the brain constant regardless of the changes of the blood pressure. So all of us sitting here listening to this talk or me talking and listen, I get agitated by the phone, uh, the blood pressure, the blood flow is going to be constant because even if my blood pressure goes up, the vessels will constrict to limit the amount of blood that goes into the brain. So the blood flow remains constant within a bracket of high or low blood pressure. Patients with vasospasm or those with subarachnoid hemorrhage that are having high, uh, hypothalamic dysfunction, they have an, an autoregulation like this, which is defective. So means that if the blood pressure is 160, they're gonna receive this much of blood flow. If it's 120, they're gonna receive this much of blood flow. So it becomes passive. And that is where the problem is. And that's the global cerebral edema we spoke about. This is the explanation of it. There is no inhibition of cerebral blood flow whatsoever. So it adds to the edema of the brain and adds to the ICP of the brain. Where does all, most of our autoregulation happens is not in the middle cerebral artery itself. It's not in M2, it's not in M3, it's not in M4, it's not in A5. It's in fact in the arterioles, so it's not even in the vessels that we see in the cortex. It's in those vessels that we see in the like in the depth that we don't see with our naked eye. So it is it is a deeper process, and you know the CTA or the um, TCD that we we're going to talk about, they only give you a hint of what's going on in the in the substance of the brain. So we have to keep that in mind and. Uh, be uh, be accepting of this fact when we choose this treatment modality for our patients. 
So again, it's not a simple plumbing. It's not an R2 to a vein, and we just increase the pressure in case of vasospasm, it will open. Uh, that will that that paradigm has to change, and it's a tree, and the arterioles are where the most of the work is being done. So how do we monitor for vasospasm? Transcranial Doppler is, is one of the most useful tools in my mind for monitoring uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage. I will say off the bat, there is uh, the first thing you will read that there is interrater uh, inter variability, and that decreases the reliability. Uh, I can tell you that with the expertise that we have, we have 13 neurosurgical residents, they all do TCDs. It's all about the repetition for the same person doing for the same patient and having the anatomical mode like you see here. This eliminates the variability for everybody because even if I come in tomorrow and do what to follow on what my colleague, the resident, did, then I will be able to see where they insinuated and then just go to the same point. So there is no, no overly concern about where the, the reliability is going to go with this. So this starts, that's why we, uh, it's important to know why we write Doppler with a capital D because it's the name of a person who's Christian Andreas uh, Doppler who described this concept in the Royal Bohemian Society of Science and he was actually kicked out of that program, out of that meeting with the claims of insanity. Then in 1950 and 60, um, the vessels of the body started to becoming insulated and then uh, ASLED in uh, 1982 was able to device the, the uh, modulate the, the probes to penetrate the skull and insinuate the in, uh, intracranial vessels. So the simplest way to explain it is that the compression of the sound wave for a moving object uh, is the source of the Doppler effect. So when the train is coming towards you, the, the, um, the sound waves are compacted so you hear the uh, the train coming to you with a sound, and then if it goes away from you, it's a different sound. It's the same train on the same track, so it should produce the same sound. But because of the directionality, it the sounds is different. The sounds are different, and this is where the Doppler probes detect this, and it can tell you whether the blood is coming towards the probe or away from the probe. This is the simple physics of the transcranial Doppler. Uh, where is it used? It's used in everything, in vasospasm, TIA, stroke, subarachnoid hemorrhage, syncope, brain death assessment, head injury, arteriovenous malformation for shunting, monitoring during procedures, and monitoring even the depth of neuroanesthesia. So it's really versatile, and it, it really takes a lot to, to just discredit it off the bat and say that it's not reliable when all of these uh, indications are being used and applied on a daily basis. So the simple premise of it is that we find the thinnest part of the bone in the temporal window, and we insinuate the vessels, as you can see here. And um, there is another window for the, the transpulminal foramen magnum, where we can see the basilar artery, and the transorbital, where we can see the ophthalmic artery and understand the flow dynamics. This is what it the, what it shows. Like you see, when the MCA it's above the uh, it's coming towards the probe, so it's above the, the the zero line. When it comes to the anterior cerebral artery, the flow is going away from the probe, too, so you see the, the the Doppler effect below the line, below the zero line, and that's how we understand it. So this is a patient who is sickler within in a crisis, and you can see the significant narrowing in the in the right MCA with the very high velocity as compared to the right side, which was normal. Uh, it, again, it's a dynamic assessment. We can look at it from a singular number or we can follow it. So it becomes a longitudinal follow-up or we can have certain tests that we can apply in a dynamic fashion to understand, for example, the autoregulation of the patient, which I will uh, say in a minute. This is a reliability issue. I think I will not uh, repeat what I said. And um, the beauty of the TCD that it's an uninvasive and safe, very informative, very interactive. You can give the medication now and to see the effect within 15, 20 minutes. You cannot do that with the CTA or CT perfusion. And it's a mobile unit. It comes to the patient. It's a point of care uh, device, which makes it very, very appealing that the patient doesn't move and uh, it's a relatively short learning curve you need 25 supervised uh, tests and you can actually start doing it on your own 
Um, I'll skip this. This is an important slide. I want you to remember this because the, uh, the classical teaching in neurosurgical books is that the number has to be above 200 for the MCA. That's false. The, the number is a relation between the MCA and the ratio of the MCA and ICA. It's called Lingard ratio. And you can see with all the, the variation between the systolic velocity and the ratio, you can judge whether this is a vasospasm or not. Where I work, I have this table plastered on the, on the TCD machine. So anybody can do the interpretation. They don't need to memorize anything. Just look at this and write what you see. Uh, to keep it simple. The pulsatility index is, a, is, an, is one of those indices that we calculate from the information we get from the transcranial Doppler. It actually helps in uh, vasospasm and uh, ICP correlation. The other test is the transient hyperemic response test. Um, and this is an indication or like a spot check for autoregulation. And uh, in essence, what you do is that you put the probe in the middle server RT and once you have a good window, you compress with your other hand, um, the middle server at the internal carotid artery at the neck. So you see at the beginning, you see the flow in the MCA. Then it drops because of the finger compression, and then it goes up. When it goes up, the a normal intact autoregulation, we, we will increase our velocity at least temporarily for a, by about 9% or 10%. If that doesn't happen, it, it means that the arteries are lazy and then they are not reactive. And we did that in head injury patients and subarachnoid hemorrhage patients, and we're, we're doing quite well in terms of assessing the, um, the autoregulation for these patients and guiding the management for them. Continuous EEG is one of the, um, one of the factors that help link the blood vessels and um, the clinical exam, because what we are missing is the cortex. And um, the um, continuous EEG is a very useful thing. We have the sub hairline EEG in, in nowadays in our units. And it's very helpful to give you an indication whether to do a formal EEG or not. I'll skip this for the sake of time and just show you this. Um, this is an example where a patient, if you see the, the dark bar, the dark blue bar in the middle, that's when the clinical vasospasm happened. The patient had the drift and the weakness and went into the angio for the pavarine and uh, the rapamil injection. But if you look six or seven hours earlier, there was a drop in the right anterior frontal EEG. So this is the beauty of this continuous EEG monitoring is that it detected the problem six hours after, six hours before the, any clinical change was detected on the patient. And this is where the multimodality monitoring is very, very crucial in these patients. So again, I'm not gonna apply this to anybody, but the patient who is classified as high risk, you, we better put everything on them. If we have any monitor, we'll use it. We'll use the TCD, we use the EEG, we use any other modality that we find uh, useful for that particular patient and uh, help us detect uh, vasospasm much earlier. So in, in, to summarize how you predict vasospasm is the decreased level of functionality. The way I describe this is that the patient will not come to you hemiplegic. The patient will come to you this way. You come to them first day, how are you? They will answer you, I'm good, I'm good, alhamdulillah, everything is over. But you, doctor, you know, the ICU is annoying, they're busy. Then uh, You come in the next morning, you say, how are you? They look at you like this and alhamdulillah. So they don't complain. That slowness in their response gives me a, a mini heart attack because this patient is not the same. They are not the same as yesterday. They're not as vigorous, as active as they did. So that's a problem that we, we have to start detecting from, from the beginning. If you see this, do drifts, the functional power like biceps, triceps, and this, the focal segmental power doesn't work here. Patients, when they are conscious, they will overcome you. But when they are not conscious, that's when you see the drift. And if you're a very high-risk patient, I'll have them do the dynamic drift where they keep circling their hands and you see the satellite sign where one hand is going to be affected more than the other and we rotate around the other one. Uh, the other thing, again, why I ask sodium first, because if, let's say the admission sodium is 145, the next day sodium is 141, 
the third day sodium is 138, that patient is in trouble because they are not able to conserve their sodium. This is telling you the hypothalamus is failing. So vasospasm is going to follow. Along with that, cerebral salt wasting will come to you in diuresis bout. So I always explain this to the uh, ICU residents. You will not see diuresis like, you know, you give someone Lasix and they're going to just pee for the rest of the day. You will see like the urine output is like 50, 50, 40, 60, then 300, 200, and then it comes down to 60, 40, 40, 40, 60. So it, that bout of two hours of high diuresis, they become, they come closer and longer. So if it lasted one hour, it's going to last two. If it took four hours, it's going to last two hours before it happens again. So this is a patient where you have to keep an eye on. And what is your first response to this? Do a TCD. And now you will look at the TCD and you'll see that yesterday velocity in the MCA was 92. Now, when you saw this uh, slowness in the patient and the diuresis that is increasing, you look, you put the probe and the velocity now today is 120. You do the Lingard ratio is five. Then you know this patient is in fact ultrasonographic radius uh, vasospasm. And you do the pulse delta index, you see it that it's decreased. So this is how you can, in a simple way, just in, in about 20 minutes, you can put where your patient is in terms of high risk, low risk. You put it at the beginning, but you do it every day as well. So remember, it's a moving target. The patients will keep changing and there is a lot of uh, inflammatory changes, thrombosis changes and uh, electrical activity that is happening in the brain that can lead to vasospasm occurring in day four or seven as we all. So here again, you classify your patient as a good grade. And as a simple rule for me, like in, in our hospital, I don't care whether the patient is reading the newspaper, is bored out of their minds, they want to get out of the ICU. Don't send the patient out of the ICU before the day four or five min minimum, at least five days, because that's when vasospasm happens. It's like three to, three to uh, four to seven days where the vasospasm happens. I know we are all pushed for ICU beds, but this is a patient that's going to be lost in the floor. Vasospasm, when it hits, can it hit very fast? In like two hours, the patient is going from normal to hemiplegic, and we will lose a lot of window with these patients. So it's better to keep them, even if they're uh, good grade, low risk, we keep an eye on them very closely. We can put them in an intermediate care unit, but never in the world. When it's a good grade, high risk, these patients stay in the ICU for the good seven days at least. Poor grade, obviously, they're going to be ICU and they're going to be monitored and you keep repeating the TCD every day, maybe twice a day if they change in any way. So you become a circular person where you do, you look at sodium, you look at TCD velocities, you look at clinical exam and you keep repeating the same cycle because believe me, the patient who you saw in the morning, perfectly intact, no drift, you can go have coffee and the nurse will come and tell you that the patient started to change. That's how dramatic these patients can be. So always uh, do the, the diligence, examine the patients, especially in the period of the onset of vasospasm at least twice a day, one in the morning, one in the evening. If you're starting a new shift in the ICU, start by examining this patient, establish what is their baseline in your shift. Don't rely on the other shift, not because they're not trustworthy, but because the patients change a lot in 10 to 12 hours. So now if the trigger is released and um, the vasospasm is there, what do you do? Remember, don't jump that this is vasospasm, I will just treat vasospasm. You have to remember the bad fives. No matter how good surgeons say they are and they clip aneurysms, there might be some residual that will re -bleed. Coiling, the same thing. Coiling will have the full effect with an interlocked thrombus seven to eight days after the coiling. So these seven to eight days, okay, we reduce the read bleed rate significantly, but we don't eliminate it. So if the patient deteriorates, the first thing you have to think about is a read bleed, regardless of what the patient was doing. So the first thing you do with this is a CT scan. So we'll talk about that. Electrolyte disturbance, again, the sodium is coming down. You never know when is the threshold for this particular patient to get worse. Some patients get worse at 132. 
some get worse at 130, some actually wait till they're, they're 116 to start having problems with the sodium. So we have to think about that. Seizure can always happen with subarachnoid hemorrhage patients, so you have to always include it in, in your differential diagnosis of anybody who deteriorates. Hydrocephalus, even if it doesn't happen in the early phase, you have to rule it out when it uh, when the patient deteriorates, then keep vasospasm till then. You have about one hour to sort this out. So what do you do? You take stat bloods, send the patient to CT. If the CT shows no re-bleed and no hydrocephalus, then do, do the CTA by default. CT perfusion helps uh, find out where the area of effect is. So in fact, in, in my hospital, we keep it simple. They go, if they're in vasospasm, they go down like a cold stroke. CT, CTA, CT perfusion, and we take it from there. And you have to rule this out and finish within one hour. Why? Because unlike the stroke patients where they have four and a half hours for, for thrombolysis IV, and they have up to 16 hours now even longer for thrombectomy, these patients, they have two to three hours maximum. The, the analysis of the on, time of onset for escalation of therapy in the angi suite, if it's within three hours, you preserve their function. Three to six hours, the function, the functional outcome takes a hit. More than six hours, they actually go into poor outcome. So finish the workup within one hour. They, these are the patients that you, you really have to push everybody. You have to push the radiologist. You have to push the neurosurgeon if you're an ICU resident. Or if you're a neurosurgery resident, push the ICU resident. Keep pushing each other to get this whole thing done. Help each other, don't fight, because I know I, I've, I've seen these fights before. And the best thing is just whoever has a free hand, just push and help and make an extra phone call to help your colleague. Um, then we go to the Triple H therapy. It's classic, it's everywhere, but uh, it has its own issues. I'm not gonna go into it, but I, I don't like it because it's not physiological. Uh, we use the um, MNH protocol, which is melanoma, normal, normal bulimia and homeostatic hypertension. Um, and that, that way we work with the patient, not against them. We work with the vascular tree, not against the vascular tree. And this way you can, you can achieve um, the best outcome for them. And this has been published and validated several times over the, over the years in the literature. So here is an example of a patient who um, has a field cut and uh, right-sided weakness. You look at the cerebral blood volume in the left, flow in the middle, um, mean transition time on the right side. Uh, if, you're, if you're very good at uh, CT perfusions, you will actually say that there might be something wrong in the um, uh, mean transition time on the right image, but you're not sure. But if you look at an autoregulation map, which is the, the time to peak, you can see that. I mean, anyone, like even a two-year-old can tell you there is this red that uh, is wrong. So what we did in this particular patient, we put a cerebral blood flow monitor, and you can see that little dot in the, right, in the left hemisphere where that um, uh, high, um, uh, a delay in uh, time to peak. And that was where the, the, the vasospasm was happening. And the patient did not respond to the IV uh, melanone. So we took the patient to intra-arterial melanone. And you can see on the left side before the melanone, the vessels are small. The right PCA, although the coil is in the left P PCA, P1, P2 junction, the, the um, right PCA is affected. The right superior cerebellar is affected you can barely, barely see the left superior cerebellar. After the melanone, this is the immediate run after the melanone. Everything is bigger, the, the circulation is, is robust in the whole uh, PCA, uh, MC, uh, PCA territory with its uh, MCA watershed zone. The patient started to improve on the table because this is where they are in the watershed area and that is where the deficits were coming from. Uh, so again, this is to reiterate the timing. You have to evaluate fast, get all the work up done, make up your mind within two hours, maximum three hours. If the patient needs to escalate to angio, go to angio. Uh, people put protocols. This is Northwestern from Chicago. They have the protocol done. They still insist on triple H therapy. I'm not going to go there, but uh, again, MNH therapy is more physiologic and more humane. 
uh, for the physician and for the patient also, because you don't want to be driving 200 and 220 of systolic blood pressure, you have a you you will have coronary spasm yourself. So again, uh, you have to have a trigger where the where the 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 angio suite is at your hand. Don't push it. If the bolus of melanone or bolus of whatever triple H therapy you wanted within one hour did not help, call your interventions to take the patient for angio. Angio, we can do a lot of things. We can do um, a balloon angioplasty like the MCA. This is an A1 severe spasm. The patient is having deficits in the leg more than the arm. Uh, and I uh, was afraid to put a balloon in there. So what we, what we did is put a stent. The stent retrievers, they have a certain radial force that kind of distributes over a long segment of the artery rather than the balloon given a focal point where you risk rupture of the artery. And this stent, you put it like it's a thread at the beginning and then you start seeing it becoming bigger and bigger. And this is the end result where the ACA restored and the whole circulation of the ACA and improvement in the MCA forward flow as well. So again, um, don't look for ICP changes. Don't look for CPP changes. The pathology is much earlier. And here, you, this is an example where an oxygen tension monitor was there. It detected the drop. Melanone was started. The, uh, the, the oxygen tension improved. The patient did not know anything. So this is how the beauty of multimodality treatment. I'll show another example where, um, where we sorry, where we have a, a sudden drop in the uh, again the oxygen tension. On the standard uh, parameters, the perfusion, the index, nothing is changing. But when you look at the um, the, um, the glucose pyruvate ratio, it's increasing. So this patient is in fact having a subclinical seizure. So this is where you have to always factor in seizure in patients who uh, deteriorate. And this, this way we come a full circle. And remember, we're dealing with a moving target from the, from the minute the patient uh, has the subarachnoid hemorrhage. If you turn your head and look at them again, they're not the same patient. So keep, your, keep updating your knowledge about everything that happens at the beginning, the thrombosis, the inflammation, the, the cortical irritation, the pulmonary changes, the cardiac changes. This is going to be like Alice in Wonderland for who, for those who know what I mean. You will keep looking at everything and diligently. And one number, if you miss it, it can it can mean deterioration in a few hours for the patients. Allah uh, jami, or I will conclude here, and um, you know, uh, I'll take any questions, or uh, I will be more interested in what Khaled and Jamil would uh, add to this discussion. If uh, if you have any point to 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 uh, complement what I said, thank you very much. Excellent talk, Wallahi uh, Hassan, and you actually make it very difficult for anyone to say anything after you. Uh, it's not that easy to uh, to come after your um, to, uh, after your talk. Uh, just have one quick question. In your opinion, if you have uh, the patient already on IV melanin, uh, loaded and maintained, mm -hmm. and uh, they become they become refractory, despite uh, you go with the, with the good dosing, one point twenty five, and sometimes even as you know, we go into higher doses for maintenance. Um, for your choice of intra-arterial uh, chemical angioplasty as an intra-arterial therapy, uh, what kind of therapy would you choose? Would you reload them again with, with Mirinone or would you load them with another agent, um, especially that uh, you wanted to act or, on, on another or different type of receptors? What's your intake into that? Yeah, that's an excellent uh, question and, and a very uh, astute observation. If you're working with the melanone, melanone is a phosphodiesterase inhibitor. It's like working on the muscles. Uh, so my answer to you is, when did the, the refractiveness happen? Like if it happened early, like you give the bolus of the melanone, the patient's not improving, you increase and within still within an hour or two, in the, in the, in the angio, I will reload them with melanone because this did not have enough, enough force to affect the cerebral circulation. But if this escalation is happening over like a day or two, then I would go more with another, uh, another factor like calcium channel blocker of rapamil or papaverine or whatever I have. Uh, usually I, I, I only use rapamil or melanone, one or the other, to just to keep it simple. 
the other factor is the blood pressure because again, what, what we conceive as normal for the patient might not be true. So for, for, for example, a patient who is on Miller known with a systolic blood pressure of 150 and they're having deficits and we increase the Miller known and they're not increasing their blood pressure, maybe the, the answer is increasing the blood pressure before jumping to increase more melanin. And this is where the disconnect happens that, you know, you give the melanin, and the blood pressure goes down, you supplement it with some levofed. Yes, because the sweet spot for this particular patient is in 160. So we have to keep the blood pressure above 160 in order to maintain enough cerebral perfusion. Here is where the TCD autoregulation really helps. So if you see that the autoregulation, you can reverse engineer it and you can tell where the systolic blood pressure was enough. And from there we can go. So this is the number for this particular patient. This is the target for this particular patient. Some patients are easy. The 140 is good for them. Some patients will need a kick. They need the 150 or 160. I've never got to 180 for any patient with the known, but this is something to consider before labeling them refractory and going to the NG. Exactly. Exactly. Dr. Amir? Thank you, Dr. Hassan, for this very uh, great and informative uh, talk. Um, so any, any, anyone has any questions for Dr. Hassan for discussion? Uh, Dr. Hassan, what do you think about uh, the, I don't know if you agree with, with me or not, um, hydrocephalus or ventricular migraine uh, is considered as a risk factor for uh, phasospasm. And so if you have a patient with uh, refractory phasospasm or in high dose merlinone, and there is still room for lowering the EVD if the patient has EVD, would you lower the EVD to drain more CSF to, to help to help the phasospasm? Uh, the simple answer is yes. <laughs> because the, 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 the situation where the, especially those patients in, in severe borderline refractory vasospasm, any bit of anything will help. So the ICP that is, let's say 2018, 2018 is not working for them. So I agree with lowering the, the ICP a little bit, not too much, because what we worry about is the re-bleed if there is an EVD, but if the aneurysm is secured, then what's the harm in, in reducing the ICP to a number like num by, by two or three might show a difference in the patient. So, uh, and the other thing I think about also is uh, the 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 wash of wash of CSF will help ICP. In fact, there is a trial that was concluded a while ago, and the paper is still under review, um, where lumbar drainage will reduce the incidence of vasospasm because whatever this subarachnoid hemorrhage that we see in the scan does not disappear in like a couple of days. It's in fact in their back, and that's why some patients have this. Uh, radicular pain in the in the back and the lower limbs and irritation and it, they respond to to steroids because the blood is down in the in the spinal canal so uh, in fact it it is it's a chemical washout so if you have an evd i would open it for that similar to a lumbar drain so i, I would not hesitate to to open the lumbar drain more uh, uh, sorry the either lumbar drain or the evd in cases of severe vasospasm but it, become, it becomes an issue like, because now when you start to wean the patient, you will have to wean one at a time. So I would tell them, wean the EVD first, then wean the melanoma because EVD will want to get it out because of this infection, but don't wean both because if you wean EVD and the melanoma patient deteriorates, you have to go back to both, both setting at the same time. And that will mean like four days for the patient in, in active treatment. So Okay, that's great. I see Dr. Um, Ahmed Nahas has a question. I'm trying to unmute him. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, Assalamu alaikum uh, and good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for, for organizing such a talk and thanks to Dr. Hussam. Uh, wallah, he made uh, a difficult subject sound very simple. Uh, my question to Dr. Hussam that um, uh, 
in our mind that uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage equals nimodipine in terms of uh, uh, pharmacological treatment, but sometimes uh, we grow short on nimodipine. So would uh, any calcium ch channel blocker uh, uh, do the same job or it's just exclusive to nimod nimod nimodipine? That's a good question. Nimodipine is a calcium channel blocker. The, the beauty of it is that it's oral. In fact, the, the initial, initial hype about nimodipine was with IV nimodipine, but then it became very difficult to, to supply it, so people shifted to oral. So this is just to show you that um, having a calcium channel blocker, in a way, helps. Nimodipine is the standard. Now, the other alternative that I personally have used before is brapamil but it was in a hospital that, that had no nimodipine, no melanone, nothing. So we had to use something. So I put the patient on a small dose of rapamil and when they got into the vasospasm, we put them on a rapamil infusion. Because again, remember, each medication works in a certain way. So calcium channel blocker, one of the sources of poor outcome that we have is the calcium influx in the cells. Which, which programs the cell to go into apoptosis and cell death. So if we block these calcium channels with nimodipine or rapamil or whatever, deltiazem or whatever you have, I think it will help. Uh, I cannot prove it, but I will I, I, certainly it will help because again, nimodipine does not eliminate vasospasm, it just reduces the severity of it. So go ahead, rapamil helps. If rapamil is, is good with cardiologists, it should be good with our patients too. I don't know, Khaled, Jamil, what do you think? Unfortunately, we're not titrating. When we use, if we use Verabamil, and uh, when we use it, we won't be titrating for effect. Uh, that's the unfortunate uh, event. We will do it. Uh, I mean, it will be a shot in the dark, uh, I believe. But it is what it is. If we don't have anything and you're running out of options, and this is the best option that you have in your kitchen, you have to do what you have to do. Um, but... Um, I mean, I, I would try my best to try to supply nimodipine. I've we've have we've managed to have our network of of uh, communication where we try to uh, send nimodipine from one hospital to another until we we supply it to our patients uh, until we manage. Yeah. So so yeah. So you bridge them for a day or two till the, either the family or your colleague from another hospital tells you that we have nimodipine that we can spare. Yeah. Do you use CT perfusion usually to diagnose vasospasm? I believe, I believe, I believe in CT perfusion. No, it, it's, not, like... it's not to make a decision. To, let me clarify. I, I, don't, I don't look at the CT perfusion and say, well, we're going to start or not. It's just to tell, tell, tell us how aggressive we should be, how low threshold we should have for the angio. Because again, it's like a, like a distal M2 occlusion or M3 occlusion that you detect on, on, on CT perfusion only. Then you backtrack and look, oh yeah, that's the vessel that is affected. And with the CT perfusion, it, it really tells us a good story sometimes. Like this particular patient I showed, I showed specifically because unlike the MCA territory where the whole territory lights up, we are looking for these little hits and, and Sometimes they're difficult to pick on a CT, to be honest. So CT perfusion help find these little holes that we're we're trying to prevent. Probably they will be more helpful in in uh, uh, poor grade cases with uh, difficult to exam the patient. Definitely, exam. definitely. But even in 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 good grades, wallahi, and I, I honestly I I don't hesitate to do the CT perfusion and and some of the radiology residents they what happens is that they refuse the CT perfusion at night because it's not a code stroke so the neurosurgery residents in my hospital and the ICU residents in my hospital they know okay they tell the radiology resident call Dr. Hussam or Dr. Hussam will call you so 90 percent of the time they don't I don't call <laughs> I usually recall vasospasm as a stroke in evolution um, yeah, because again, it's um, it's an added contrast. I understand, but it's it's to a much added information because we're not looking at big deficits, big defects in the in the in the brain. They're going to be little ones, but multiple. 
So it's better to, to have a handle on them early on. I will not repeat it with every scan, that's for sure, but at least at the time of the, let's say the onset of the vasospasm, we have one CT perfusion to, 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 have, to have at hand and know where we are. The follow-up scan is just gonna be like a simple non-contrast CT. Okay, uh, Dr. Haifa and Gatami, have a question, yes. go ahead. Assalamu alaikum rahmatullah. Thank you very much for a great presentation and thank you for the great uh, discussion with our moderators. Uh, I have uh, one question because uh, we don't have uh, a good experience with TCD and we don't have a kind like other kind of neuromonitors. So how frequent like safely we can do CTA, CT perfusion? Like sometimes we end up doing every other day or every 48 hours. Uh, so is still like can can do it safely for our patient just to follow for the vasospasm yeah. because most of the time like either sedated or not awake so clinical yeah, picture will not be helpful yeah. yes I, I i thank you dr haifa and uh yani, thank you for putting all this together dr haifa she's the head of our saudi spine uh, saudi neurocritical care chapter and it takes a lot of effort to to put these things together, especially dealing with three, with two neurosurgeons, yani, uh, that's, that's, uh, inshallah, for Mizan Hassanatik, Dr. Haifa. Your question is very valid, you know, it's a radiation concern. Um, can, I always resort in this discussion to the CLEAR trial. The CLEAR trial, the IV uh, thrombolysis, they actually um, scanned patients every day for five days. With those that we give in the CT scan, which is non-contrast, is is not is not that bad if we want to repeat the scan. Now, يعني, ال, 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 I, I agree that there is no TCD, no um, clinical picture. How frequently you can do it? I, يعني, I, I can break down the time period هذه, into into phases. So, if you say like the spasm onset is four to seven days, so you have a scan there. The spasm usually reaches the peak at 9 to 11. So you have another scan there. And towards the end, like towards 14, just to know that did, did they subside well enough. And then about the patients, they linger for more than 14. So had the three scans, for sure, Now, a clinical exam, if it's the same, you can push the scan another day. But that is the patient connected to tubes and lines and everything. But if the patient is worse, the level of consciousness is worse, a, a, a clinical exam, had the can be weakness, it's worse, well, a GCS can seven, SAR five, then I, I think there is no other alternative. We have to do it even at the same day, repeat it in the, in the evening. I will do that. And it's a tough sell, the radiologist sometimes, but we have to do it. If they can feed, feed detectable deterioration, there is no 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 alternative for monitoring you need the marib stable i would have these like at least three spots you know, every other day or the third day if everything is stable patient is too too you know, maintaining themselves then we can do it every third day so uh, i have a question uh, actually for uh, let me to ask this uh, it happened to me once. Uh, I was in a dilemma whether to, to do it or no. So let's say you have a, a patient with uh, modified Fisher grade four and uh, poor grade, and he developed acute kidney injury. Uh, you can't do MRI or uh, MRA for, he has um, contraindication to that. You don't have TCD available at your hospital. Would you use, uh, let's say a day, 10, the peak of the phasospasm, would you use the merinone and the measurement for phasospasm empirically? If you don't have any tools to, to know if have, going to have, phasospasm or not. Do you have EEG? Yeah, that's... I'm, I'm asking this, Leno, this is the, this is, Leno, Zema, yani, yani, okay, you'll start the melanone for something. So, yani, you have at least one parameter. It will drop the blood pressure. Now you're starting chasing something that you don't know what it is. Adding one parameter would be, will be helpful. But to be honest, yani, if the patient is, let's say in, in that same scenario, the patient is having sodium that is going down, 
يعني clinical exam that is worsening يعني حتى لو في risk of acute kidney injury I would treat it like a stroke just go وبعدين يعني honestly مع new contrast agents um, some some people some nephrologists are actually questioning the contrast nephropathy مع new contrast um, I know people go some, sometimes like hyperbolic كذا ويقول لك it's a unicorn no it's not a unicorn we see it in patients بس برضو الواحد يكون يعني منصف للمريض إذا إحنا جايين لسه يعني patient is not doing very well day 8 ترى the worst is still coming 9, 9 to 11 هذه هو البيك of the spasm إذا والله وصلوا هناك خلاص you can let go و monitor with the EEG مثلا وكذا فيعني it becomes a judgment call but if there is worsening I will do the, 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 the contrast without hesitation Thank you, Dr. Hassam. I think we are past our uh, our time. Uh, greatly appreciate it. Uh, thanks for your uh, effort. I know that you've just came in from uh, your flight and you gave the talk. Uh, yes, thanks yeah. to Dr. Haifa and to the Neurocritical Care Chapter uh, and to the Secretary. It's extremely uh, tiresome job to uh, chase all of us to 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 be here, but. Uh, I really appreciate uh, all the effort by everyone. Tislam. Jazakumullah khair. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Jazakumullah khair, Jamian. Shukran jazeelan. Thank you very much, Rose, for your support. Tislam. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you. Good night. Good night.